Now we're going to take a look at the rolling tire and how it's running using as many procedural methods as possible so that it can be adjusted and everything updates correctly with it. So I'm just going to double click on the rolling tire uh, layer and uh, I'm also going to select the ground and do Alt Q to isolate so that uh, we're just looking at it. Now, if we take that and hit play with the forward slash, you'll notice that the tire rolls downhill. It's leaving a tire track behind and it falls down to a stop. Now, most of this is happening completely for free. Just a few adjustments and it's all happening on its own. I'm gonna turn off the viewport filter, which is filtering out currently for non-rendering objects so we can kind of see what's going on. So you see, I have two splines. I have my tire. And I have a few point helpers in here that are you know, essentially the rig. You know, one of the things to note whenever you're setting up something like this is you should never be animating the object itself. I wanna be able to swap that tire out for another tire really easily if I wanted without having to reset up any of the animation. So it's a simple rig with just point helpers and splines in this case. So this top spline is the one that kind of drives it all. In the modifier panel, we can see what's going on here. I have a line, just a basic line, and I have show end result turned off currently, so you'll see the bottom one no longer looks correct, but the top one's there, and if I press one on the keyboard, you'll notice uh, that we're in vertex mode, and we've got you know a simple setup with vertices with some Bezier handles. Also, this is completely flat, you'll notice. Okay, so it is purposely flat, and I'm not trying to follow the ground or anything. Let's turn off the, the vertices again, and we'll go up to the normalized spline. So what normalized spline's doing, if I turn on show knots, I have a knot count. Now we could also do a length count, but one of the issues with the length count can be that it can add, you know, sort of odd lengths at the end, depending on it. You can see where the end starts overlapping and doing some little twisting back. That's going to really foul uh, how, the, how it comes to a stop at the end. So in this case, I've done a knot count. Now, one thing I didn't do was dr uh, drive this knot count with the length of the spline, which would be perfectly possible. We could have the knot count based on, you know, how long the spline gets and be recreating it, kind of like spline length does, but without the problem of having that, you know, extra little bump happening on the end, a little kind of rollback that can happen on it. I'll just turn off the show knots here. So this bottom spline, Ed, that's down below, you'll notice is actually a reference, not an instance, it's a reference. So this part of the stack right here, the bottom part of the stack is identical to this one. So, you know, on this object, I went control V and I made it a reference object for the next one down below. So it actually resides, if I turn off the stack, you'll notice it's right in the same place. So it has normalized spline and everything. And that's what this line here denotes that this is a reference from above here. I put a, the conform modifier on, I pick the ground, we're just pushing it down in Z, so it's you know attached to the ground, and then a little bit of a spline relax, just to make sure that you know the ground is pretty low resolution here, you know, and it could be causing some really sort of like just you know, I guess you could call them kind of violent uh, direction changes in the spline. So I put a spline relax on just to soften it a bit. Now you got to be careful as to how much you turn that up, obviously, but you can see that it is immediately, as soon as I start pushing it up, you can see it's disappearing into the ground in places because it's relaxing so much. So it's just a little subtle change. And if I turn that on and off, you can see it's just cleaning up the shape a little bit more, which is nice, getting a bit smoother path for the tire to roll along. So the next thing we need to look at is what's happening with the tire and how it's been rigged up. So you'll notice there's a point helper in the middle. It's aligned up to the tire. So you can see it's been you know, angled over with it. Um, it is parented, if I push page up, it is parented down to a point helper at the ground. And you'll notice that it's also lined up to it. And importantly, it is orientationally aligned to it. So it's y-axis points out here and y-axis points out here. Reason for that is, is objects transform in their parent space, not in their own. So if this was on some other angle, you know, the, the Z was pointing out here, we'd probably try and get the tire to roll around that local Z axis and it wouldn't. It would spin around, um, you know, looking like a spinning top because its parent is pointing up in this direction here. You can see there's the Z of the parent. So we keeping things aligned, 
keeps things really, really handy. Well, this uh, parent object, we'll start with it. Go over to the motion panel and we'll row down and take a look at the path constraint that it's on. So it's on a path constraint and these are basically the only keys. You can see I've got three keys on this object and it is rolling from beginning to end along that path. Now for this, I have uh, bank turned on and I've adjusted the bank amount uh, and you'll see where I needed to adjust that. That could be animated as well if you wanted. I mean, you could animate it with keys or we could try and find some way of automating it. The, the, pa the path percentage is the only one in this case that is, is animated. Now what we have is a second one that's here and you'll notice it's also on a path constraint sitting on the same path and it follows at exactly the same time. So it's following along with it. So to ensure that I'm not having to uh, change keys on two objects to keep them moving along the path at the same rate, what I've done is I took the original down here, or you could do it the other way, I guess, if you wanted. And I said, copy controller. And I went over to the, the second and I said, paste instance controller. So they're one and the same animation controller. Keys change on one, changes on both. Saves, your, uh, uh, you know, saves you from doing extra work. Now, what is the difference with this one? Well, you'll notice that bank is turned off. So I'm not allowing it to bank. It's staying upright, it's on follow. So it's following the path and pointing along the direction of it, but it isn't leaning over with the curves, okay? And that is going to help us drive the angle of the tire um, it, it later. So the, you'll see what happens. It's gonna offset the tire to ensure that it stays on the ground properly. Now the one in the center of the tire is making it rotate. So we'll start there with some of the, uh, the math that needs to be done to get this to rotate correctly. Now this path can change length at any point in time. So I actually have an edit spline on here and I can change it and the tire will continue to rotate at the correct rate. It'll kind of lean over through the little bends and twists that are going on now to make the tire wobble back and forth. And so it's still rotating at the same rate because because the math is driving it based on the length of the spline. So uh, with that point helper selected back to the motion panel into the frozen transform. So I did an alt right click freeze transform. So I knew that I was starting at a zero value. And I put a float script controller on the Y, the one that it needs to rotate around. I'm just gonna double click on that to open it. And let's inspect and see how I've set some of this up to get this uh, script controller to ensure that the tire rolls correctly. We need a couple of values in here to reference. The first one is the spline itself. So we need to be, have access to the spline so that we can get its length. And so I have a variable that I created called SPL and I set it up with a node. Now something to note, when you come in here, it can be real troublesome to find the node you're looking for inside of a large scene. You know, isolating things can help a lot and whatnot, but one of the interesting tricks is to use a sign constant. So if we know the name of the path and we can grab tire path, we can just go assign constant and we can then do dollar sign tire path and evaluate and it'll actually set it up to be that object. You can also do that with controllers. You can do it, you know, as long as you know the path to a controller or to a track, you don't actually have to use any of these buttons to be able to set up the, uh, the connections. So that's getting us the spline that we can ask for the curve length. And you'll see here in the equation, we're looking for the curve length and the curve length will return how long that spline is in units. Now we need a couple other things. We need the percent, so I created one called P and it is set up and you'll see that it's accessing the controller and that controller is for the controller here that is driving it along the path. Now, same thing, you could use the constant if you know the path to this in Max Script and type it in and it'll grab it or you, of course you could go and assign controller. So why didn't I use track? Well, track assigns the named track. And if anything happens to that named track, like being renamed, okay, it'll lose connection to it. Or even if you decided you wanted to uh, copy and paste an instance of this controller to something else, it's going to lose connections to tracks because they're just using named properties. 
Whereas when you use controller, it's grabbing the object that is the controller, the thing that we can copy and paste instance, for instance, when we connected these values together. And it is a little safer to hang on to. It's also faster. It is an object being an object oriented you know, software. It's going to grab that. So you can see here in where we say p.value, we're having to access the value of the controller that's being stored in p. R is representative of the radius of our tire. Now, I ended up by mistakenly collapsing this, so it's no longer being procedurally generated in this scene. I probably could go back and replace it with the one that is, but what I did to get around that is I added this circle so that I can use this as reference to my radius. Now, you'll notice that the radius is 52.06. I just copied and pasted that in as a constant here. But this really, again, you can, you know, if I suddenly decide I want to scale the tire up and down and change the radius uh, roller here, you know, I'm going to have to do more work to, you know, go back in and change the number again. So I can use that constant. So this is called tire radius. I'm just going to go into constant. I'm going to say dollar sign tire radius dot radius, which is the value that we're trying to access, this value right here. And to make sure that and if we just did this right now, it would grab the value, but it wouldn't have a permanent connection to it. So I'm going to grab the controller for it, dot controller. Now, if I evaluate this, you'll see undefined. That's because a lot of tracks don't come with a tro controller preset on it. Skip over to the uh, motion panel go down and find radius, and I can just go reset to default controller. You'll now notice it has a Bezier flow controller on it. Redefine this, now we have that uh, controller held. So this is gonna error now, because you'll notice that R was just a value before. And so if I evaluate this, it's gonna go, hey, I don't know what that is. So what we need is the dot value of the controller in there, and say evaluate, and everything comes up as it should do. So how does this expression work? Well, the first one is that typical math we learned way back in high school, 2 pi r, and it is essentially getting us the circumference so we know how far around it is. Well, then we need to know how far we've traveled along in units at any given point. So we have the, um, uh, the, the you know, percent along the path, and we've got the length of the curve. So we're getting then, by multiplying one to the other, we're getting the distance traveled. So how far have we traveled along that spline? Then we're simply taking the distance divided by the circumference, multiplying it by 2 pi. The reason that is, is that we need to convert this to radians, and a radian is 2 pi. It is pi times 2. So um, we're converting it here. You could also do other ways of doing it. There's uh, rad to deg and deg to rad to convert back and forth. Uh, this is times two, uh, two pi. So that'll give us now the tire rotating when we evaluate that and rotating the correct amount, no matter how long that spline gets, it'll always rotate along with it. Now, one more thing had to happen, I found. The tire has a width. So as that tire comes around and, for instance, starts to fall onto the ground down here, you'll notice the tire is still just touching the ground. And you'll notice it's not following the path in the middle of the tire here. That's because the tire's got width. If it actually did just sort of follow the path and roll around, by the time it landed on the ground, it would be halfway stuck into the ground because it would be on the path. So to get around that, what I decided to do was take the object that's doing the rotation and not only do the rotation, but I decided it needed to push it sideways so that it was moving sort of over so that it would you know always just touch on the corner of the tire so what i did was i put you'll notice here a little bit of control on here so in the y-axis i have a float wire where i have wired it back to something to push it sideways bending on the angle so this is where these two um, point helpers come into play so i have the one that essentially is tilting the tire over and one that is just there for reference so i needed to know the angle between these two objects to be able to push the tire sideways as that tire that angle increased near the end down here and i needed that to go sideways so what i'm using to do that is a 
Expose Transform Helper. And the Expose Transform Helper allows you to get at values can't otherwise access in 3ds Max. So in this case, it is referencing the two points that are down here. So the tire and the, the one that's tilting it over and the one that is not is being referenced in here. And then we can go ahead and get the angle changes between those with the Euler angles. And those Euler angles can then drive things. So you'll notice that I'm using the exposed X value because that's the one that is uh, angling over sideways. And I'm simply driving the Y position here so that it's, it's driving it over on its side. That allows me to be able to offset the tire, stop it from going into the ground, and it looks like it's all you know kind of nice and going in the right directions. Now the last little trick that I did was putting this tire path on the ground. So this was actually a lot of fun. So what this is doing is, is just a plane, and I'll just turn off show end result with alt tilde. So it's just a long plane here. And I had to do a little bit of funky math on this to get this to work as well. Uh, don't need this bend modifier. I've got an X form on it. And what that X form modifier is doing is, is centering um, or moving, I guess, really the offsetting the, the pivot of the object. So you notice the pivot appears to be on the end now. Whereas if we go down to the bottom, when you create a plane, it's in the middle. Now I wanted this to remain 100% procedural and not collapse it or manually move the pivot point. So I'm using an X form modifier to move it over here. Now, again, to make that work and make it be completely dynamic, I'm connecting that X form modifier and I'm sliding the gizmo across down here with a float script. So it's, it's basically getting the curve length divided by five and moving it out. Now, this, the length of the splines, so the actual length value of the spline, or the, sorry, the plane is also being driven. So it's being driven by the length of the spline. And this, this you know, plane is getting longer based on the length of the spline. So if I go and turn this off, and turn off that edit spline and go back and check out that path, it'll actually be shorter than it was before because it doesn't need it. So you can see the length is grayed out here. So it is being driven by that, that curve length. So I'm offsetting it so to ensure that the uh, pivoted is at one end. I'm sticking a slice plane on it and driving it as well. So the slice plane is driving along. So if we scroll back, you'll notice that it is revealing the spline from zero, and that's why I offset it. So the uh, slice plane is there with remove positive, and it is being driven along by the percentage again. So it's being moved along that uh, length of that with the same sort of math that's generating the, the you know, the, the tire rolling and everything else is getting the curve length, doing a little bit of math on it to be able to drive it along that length. Path to form it, and it'll path the form right from the beginning. And then I'm conforming it to the ground. So that comes out really nice. Now you could say, well, what if you just grew the, the, uh, the shape and made it longer or the percent along the path? Well, that won't work so well when you're considering the fact that we're trying to get a texture on there that isn't sliding along the ground. So the texture on here is really simple, it's physical material. I used, let's see, uh, an OSL noise, Uber noise, you know, gradient. So the uh, color curves and, you know, pulled just the red track to get a nice gradient across it. And that's driving the cutout and it's also driving a bump map. And then I've just got, a, you know, a noisy texture with a bit map that I've put in there. You could even use a noise to, to drive that. And the idea then is what we get is just this dirt path that is being laid down on the ground behind it. And again, any changes to the spline will update the, the plane, will update its speed and everything else, and it'll always follow along behind it. So all those little things put together means that I now have a tire that I can add rolling anywhere in the scene. I could just copy this over and drop it somewhere else and it would follow the contours of the surface. It would roll at the right speed and I might just need to adjust the keys on the path just to make it roll at the right speed and, and whatnot, which I could probably find some ways of uh, automating as well, but it was easier just to add the three keys.